in and uh, welcome you all. So um, welcome to today's IAPCNM CPD and Business Building Masterclass. Uh, my name is Julie Kennedy and I am your host. And today I am delighted to welcome Cynthia Wiharja, executive coach, career development coach, leadership mentor, founder of The Brave Zone, which I must admit sounds particularly great, and a professional fire starter. So that already makes me feel warmer. We were talking about the cold and so much more. So thank you already, Cynthia, for being with us here today and for sharing your expertise and experience to help us, right, to develop ourselves as coaches. Um, first, some housekeeping. So our call today will be a maximum of one hour, including 15 minutes Q&A. The session is recorded, so please keep on mute uh, until we, uh, you know, until it's question time. But it's wonderful if you do keep your video on. It makes it a, a lot nicer for, for the speaker and for the rest of us. Now, the questions, we suggest keeping them until the end. But what you can do is already, when you think of them, add them into the chat box. Otherwise, you might forget them later on. And like that, we can take them uh, when we get that far. So topic today is attracting your ideal client as a coach. Uh, and well, all I can say is, yes, please help me attract the ideal client. So grab your CPD pad and a pen, settle comfortably and listen up. So over to you, Cynthia. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, Julie. And um, thanks for IAPC and M as well. Um, it, it's been good to come back to this topic because I haven't spoken about this in almost a year. Uh, over the last year, I started a new venture, a fashionable antique shop in Bath. So if you ever come um, uh, my way around, uh, we have two, we are the only two uh, antique shops between the Royal Crescent and the Circus. It's absolutely gorgeous. Reason being is I've just, uh, after 25 years in um, business, I realized that lots of things in business is very similar. And because I've spent the last 13, 14 years building a business coaching firm in Indonesia and in the UK and training um, coaches around the world, um, how to market themselves. I found that it was when you move to Bath, when you move to a new city, the last thing you wanna do is work from home. So the retail was my way to make friends and it has been quite a journey and we've been doing very well despite you know COVID and all that kind of stuff. So today is about you. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Is that okay for everyone? Yes, good. Um, so uh, I may not necessarily see you just because I'm uh, the screen has to be shared. So I will just do my best to um, acknowledge you. But Julie, please feel free to just unmute yourself and disturb me if if I just rattle on. That does happen. I will. <laughs> okay, so um, the topic is brave marketing is very special because for me, I think um, I grew up in a sales role and where I was selling products and services. And when I became... Um, when I founded a business coaching company and I realized I was helping coaches market themselves and I was selling people, I realized that sometimes marketing yourself is very much more difficult than marketing a thing. Because a lot of times we get in our own way. You can say, oh, wow, this product is fantastic. And you say all the world about it. But when it comes to saying I'm fantastic or I'm, I've got a unique selling point, it's really hard and confusing to get there. You know, how many of you agree with that? Okay. And um, it's a lot about how you understand yourself. My background in psychology helped a lot. I took um, master NLP courses as well. So that helped a lot, but that was my, it, it was very nice for me to get into that business. And I think that's why I stayed for so many years, built the business, taught coaches. And when I became a business coach, I basically helped coaches market uh, themselves instead of just marketing myself as a business coach. Because I think, the art of selling people is very important. The art of helping people understand what's amazing about them is, and what's special about them is very important. Um, so that's where we're going to go. How to go from confusion, which we often feel when we're marketing ourselves, to confidence. And I'll share the three types of confidence later, what you need to get um, to propel your business. There are three specific types of confidence that you need. Um, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I'd like to keep this 
just very casual. So instead of a QA and a at the, at the end, if you want to just ask, um, please feel free. Um, I hope Julie can monitor the chat box because I won't be able to do that. Um, but yeah, feel free to do that. I don't have a lot of slides. I'd like to keep it casual. Maybe sometimes I throw out a question just to make sure everybody's still awake, and, uh, and then we can we can we can discuss. Just a little bit about me, so you know a little bit more about my background. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's where my uh, all my profile is. Uh, so 25 years, multinational companies in sales roles, marketing roles, and then later I helped to turn around unprofitable business. The, the, the corporate job helped me to understand how business works, because a lot of times, especially when we're, you know, coaches or consultants or therapists or whatever we are, or artists, you know, we know how to do the do very well. You know, we know how to counsel people, for instance, if you're a counselor. So you know the technical part of the business, it's like a carpenter, they know how to you know, make a cabinet, but they don't know how to market themselves as a carpentry business. So sometimes you can counsel people very well, but when it comes to marketing yourself and managing your business, um, it's a different ball game. So uh, the corporate job helped me to, to um, understand how business works. And again, every business is the same. Now I own an antique shop, it's kind of the same thing. You know, that's the nice thing about learning all this stuff. You can just use it again and again. Uh, I founded in 2008, I founded Action Coach Jakarta, which is still running as one of the top firms in Indonesia for business and executive coaching. And those are my partners on the top right. Um, they bought me over uh, in May. So I just sold that company after um, a good 12, 13 years. Um, that was good. That was very good. I was very pleased with that. Um, and then on top of that, in my action coach career, um, I helped other co countries to launch the franchise in their countries, train coaches, um, and train people to operate firms. Because what I had was not just a self-employed business. I actually had a firm with staff with six coaches that I was marketing. That's how we became a big firm, because um, I was more interested in growing a business rather than just marketing myself only because I can I feel that we can help more people if we can get more coaches to be successful and they have been we've been top three firms in the world uh, out of you know about I think at that time what were we doing about 80 countries we were top three in the world and we were judged by US dollars so we we're billing in rupiah but we were measured by US dollars and we still reached top three so that was quite good. Um, and then when I moved to Bath, I stopped the action coach, uh, um, my, my hand, I became a silent partner for a while before they bought me over. And then I started thinking, what kind of coaching do I like to do? Somehow, instead of doing SME business coaching and all that stuff, I was attracted to helping more coaches market themselves. So that's how I became a kind of, I guess, a branding coach for coaches. I was also speaking, still speaking in various stages. Um, and then I was still helping out volunteering at Radio Bath to be a business presenter, which I've stopped now because I'm focusing on my business. I just stopped that about two months ago. So these have been uh, my clients over the last two years, when, as I started um, my own, I, my, my personal identity as a brand coach for, for these special people. And it was about helping them identify where their marketing message didn't fit them or uh, you know helping them to understand how to talk about their business how to talk about themselves how to be um you know unique in a in a crowded market like say you're an executive coach well yeah join the group you know <laughs> and and how how to be how to how to be part of the group but also stand out and uh, what's more important is it starts with you. It starts with your own self-mastery. So I always say marketing yourself starts with mastering yourself. So I know this is very, you know, um, uh, the associates kindly call this a master class. You know, um, I have to say that in this class, I want to, to make sure the, the definition of master class is your journey of mastering yourself. You know, I am definitely not a master in this. I'm still learning myself. So let's learn together. So we had talked about brave marketing. We're talking about brave marketing. You are now possibly confused on how to position yourself. What are the three types of confidence that you need to grow your business? 
in my experience, you need confidence in your value and uniqueness. What, you know, when people give money, they are exchanging money for a value. It's like the best businesses solve a problem or have fits, um, solves a gap in the market. Your value proposition has to be very clear. Okay, that's what you have to master. What value are you giving? So my value proposition is confidence, for instance, clarity. Um, maybe some of you is, um, I remember one of my clients is an eating disorder coach. Her value proposition was basically helping people get over an eating disorder through self-acceptance. Okay, self-acceptance. So when people give you their credit card or they're, they're giving you cash for your services, they are basically exchanging it. It's like when we go to the shop, you know, we go to the fun store, we give them a credit card, they give us some clothes. That has to be as clear as that, you know? And if you're not, oh, you know, if you're not clear on your value proposition, this is like one of the most confusing things because every networking event, you're going to say something different about yourself. If you're not clear about your uniqueness, this becomes a hurdle as well because you start saying things that's very standard or you start saying, oh, I'm a, I, I help people, blah, blah, blah. But then everybody else says the same thing. But I bet you, if you really understand how you came to become what you are, there's a lot of value and uniqueness that you can find about yourself. I'll discuss that later. The second confidence is the confidence that your client engagement strategy is suitable for the types of clients you want to attract. You know, sometimes I remember a business coach that I was helping. Um, she wants to attract big businesses, but her value proposition, her persona, her personality isn't suitable for big businesses. But, you know, in the business coaching world, I'm not sure if any of your business coaches, there's a little bit of an ego. Oh, I coach a $5 million business or I coach a 10 million pound business. And that's cool. That's cooler than a business coach that just coaches some, somebody under a million. So she was a bit trapped with that, you know, and she wanted to have this persona. She was trying to engage clients who are big businesses. They didn't want to be engaged by her. They didn't feel attracted to her. There's nothing wrong with her. The problem was she was ignoring the market that really appreciates who she was, which was a small business owner market, the one that really didn't know anything about cash flow and finance, they need to be handheld. And now she, hopefully she's growing to think that that's cool. <laughs> you know? And her husband, she does uh, this business coaching business with her husband. Her husband does attract the big multi-million pound businesses. And that's him. That's okay. You know, but she doesn't. And trying to be someone you're not is a bad client engagement strategy. So what kind of clients are you attracting? What are their problems? How do you engage them? We'll talk about that in more detail later. Then the third confidence is in your marketing approach. Everybody has this thing that, you know, everybody wastes a lot of time doing lots of stuff, okay? But let's understand what marketing strategy puts you in the best light and what marketing strategy will engage the right kind of clients. You know, so um, we'll talk about that later as well. Any questions so far? Yes, I was going to say, did you want me to, to because I see we do have yeah. a question in, um, Cynthia asks, but when a person is a beginner coach, they still don't know exactly how or what speciality they want to work on. They just want to coach at first. So how do they work on their value proposition if they're not yet clear? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're going directly to that answer when we talk about understanding who you are and why you decided to become a coach. Okay. I'll, I'll answer that very quickly. Um, actually, is that the only question? For now, yes. Good. So let's start. <laughs> so we start, so the Brave Marketing Framework, um, this is my signature solution. It's divided into three parts you, client, and marketing. So we'll start with the understanding of you. Before you ask, how do you market? My, how, how do I market myself as a coach? Ask who before how, okay? So the first who you need to understand is who are you, okay? So who are you is going to answer that question. Um, has anyone ever heard of Simon Sinek and finding your why? 
if you're in the industry for a while, you know that's a pretty popular book for everyone. Okay. Um, a purpose, vision, why it's been interpreted in so many different ways. What I like about Simon Sinek's way is your your why is why did how did life bring you here? Okay, so it was connecting life events that's happened to you and helping you understand the significance of those memorable events and then later finding a pattern, common themes about who you are. For instance, let's go back to that eating disorder coach. She was a newbie coach. So she used to call, I met her in a networking session. She didn't call herself an eating disorder coach. She called herself a health coach, like every health coach. There's like 17 health, coach, health coaches in that room. Everybody was a health coach. But as a health coach, you're thinking, well, what are you, an exercise coach, a diet coach, a Pilates coach? What, what are you, right? So she was equally confused, but she's never coached before. She doesn't know her value proposition. So we, we just, just, we just stopped thinking about her value proposition for a moment and we talked about her. She told me about her life from childhood all the way till now. She told me of memorable events that's happened. What do you remember most? I remember this happened to me, this happened to me. She went to boarding school. Um, she was always being um, uh, reprimanded and she didn't feel good about herself. She stopped eating. Uh, she ate an apple a day, but swam, you know, multiple laps. And, and then what did it mean to you? So I just listen. I'm, I'm always the secretary there. So I always type, they, they always just, just talk. And what did that mean to you? And then she felt a loss of control. And the only thing she could control was eating. If she stopped eating, so she wanted to gain back control of her life because everybody was influencing her. Everybody was disciplining her. Everybody was telling her she's not good enough. And her way of handling that situation was to be in control. Of the only thing you can be in control of is eating. So she stopped eating and she became anorexic for the next 30 years. And uh, But uh, there was a turning point where she recovered. Um, and now she stops calling herself a health coach. She calls herself an eating disorder coach. She didn't even call herself a diet coach because for her, eating disorder is anorexia, um, uh, uh, you know, obesity, but also disordered eating. You know, when we eat bad things, even though we don't want, we know it's bad, or we want to stop eating something, but we can't, or, you know, all that kind of stuff is disordered eating. You might not have any, any, any um anything to treat is just you can't control yourself so that's she, she really focused and she's been on uh on live interviews she's she's doing very well because now she knows her value proposition is not just health coach it's an eating disorder coach and she has her own one-liner and everything like that but that's how you know so stop let, let's stop thinking about your value proposition a minute and just think about you and allow yourself um, to, to go through your memorable life events. You, have, you don't have to go through your entire life. It's just the memorable parts because the memorable parts meant something to you. And then the other column, what do you mean? What did that mean? And, and we would go, we would do this for two and a half hours. This session is quite long. After that, you will see a common pattern. You will see a common pattern, not feeling good about yourself, lack of self expense lack of self-love. And then there's a turnaround point and la, la, everybody's got that hero story. So it's about finding your own hero story. Now you can do this by just reading the book and just doing it yourself. Uh, if I can help in any way, just let me know. But after that, you'll have some common themes. And then from reading all that, you can also start seeing what is my personal value? What are the things that's important to me? Like for her, self-acceptance was important. For her, uh, love, self-love was important. You know, so I would say that's your personal value, blah, 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 blah. And then we create a why statement. Okay, so, and, and, and that's how you really figure out your value. So sometimes you answer a question by not asking the question, by asking another question. You approach it in a different way. And that's why if you haven't read it, uh, the book, uh, Start With Why, Simon Sinek does it 
amazingly well. Now, I've learned a lot by coaching. I don't know. I think during lockdown, it was fun. I was coaching about 40, 50 people in a year doing this because there's so many self-employed people that rose out because they were uh, they were restructured out of their company or they said, yeah, uh, I'm just going to take this you know, few months of not doing anything to, to, to sharpen my branding. Um, but I learned a lot uh, when all this, I've got a, a workbook, I've got a digital course and everything. What I learned was if I gave them the workbook and say, right, before we start, why don't you try to do this and fill it out? That's bad. Because <laughs> if you try to do it yourself, okay, um, it's it's funny when you do it yourself and you ask yourself these the same questions and you try to fill it out, you miss so much. And then you say, I didn't get it. I don't get the exercise, right? So if you are going to do this yourself, just get a friend to do it with you and help them see it, see you, okay? If, you know, you don't have to, I'm not here to sell my services or anything, but if you decide to just do it yourself, great, read the book, but then get a friend to do it with you because then they will pick at you and get like, get the friend that you sometimes often wonder why they're your friends because they're so, you know, they're so, they challenge you, they get all that, those are the good ones. The ones that just, uh-huh, uh-huh, nah, nah, get, get a challenging one. <laughs> Get your mother-in-law, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So that's, I hope that's answered the question. And it's it's hard to, to explain without really doing the process. But do you understand that if you understand how you got here, you know, why is confidence so important to me? Because I lived with very, very, very low confidence you know, moving to the States, how I was brought up, how I was, how I was disciplined as a, as a child, how I relate to my parents. I have very little confidence. So now helping, I think that's why it attracted me to help people regain their confidence and understand themselves is important. I've also made lots of huge life and relationship mistakes because I didn't understand who I was and I didn't understand my value. So finding, helping people find their value for me is an important passion, not just um, you know, a, a book or something I sell, you know, it's, and, you know, I could, I could, I guess, move to the UK and do what I did before coach big businesses and blah, blah, blah. I had a coach executives. I, I was filled with executive clients at that point, but I find that it wasn't as fulfilling, but I also find that even if you're doing this once, you also kind of have to refresh it. You know, I, I don't know, maybe some of you have been doing this coaching business or therapy or whatever you're doing for a while. And then you're at a phase that it's not that you don't understand this stuff, but you feel a bit bored of what you do. You feel that it lacks meaning because you've been doing it for like 10 years. And now for some reason, it lacks meaning. That's what happened to me as well. Okay. 13 years, you know, I found business coaching stops having meaning for me. So I did that brave marketing, blah, blah, blah. And after only two years, I find that there was a, a plateau of my enthusiasm, right? I still have this. I'm, I'm happy to, to still help people with it. But is this something I'm going to be excited? No, I believe that we all go through seasons in our lives. And for me, it was a season of making friends. That's why I have the antique business. In the back burner, if you see my LinkedIn profile, it used to be all about brave marketing. Now it's about leadership coaching and helping leaders become happier because as I reflect, after two years of doing this, I had a mix of clients, mostly self-employed professionals, but I also had a lot of corporate leaders still coming to me, even though I was in England. And then uh, I did a few of those. And then I felt, you know, I really love helping stressed out leaders become happier and more effective on their way to their career, blah, blah. blah. So what I'm saying is, you, you do need a refresher. You just don't do it once, find your value proposition, and that's it. You know, we are dynamic. And if you find yourself, if you're the types like, oh yeah, I know how to do this, but why do I feel bored now? Redo it. Be very honest with yourself and don't give yourself a label. Just do it. Your only label is your name. And then come back to this. And maybe this is a time for you to refresh. Maybe your old stuff. You've been great at your old stuff, but now it's not fulfilling you. So that's, that's I hope that answers the question. 
The second um, part of you is making sure you've got the right belief system. So it's amazing. You know, you want to sell yourself, you want to market yourself, but you have very low self-esteem or you have a limiting belief of how much money you can charge or you have a limiting belief of how much your time is worth. You know, no good, right? So I'm sure everybody's heard of limiting beliefs, um, identity iceberg, things like this is, I've created a power meter test. You know, it's like, you know, how, how much power do you have? How much power do you have to fuel your business? Because if your battery is low because you're stuck with all these limiting beliefs, then it's really hard to, to move forward. So that's the second part of this. And the third part of mastering yourself is understanding your ikigai. The ikigai is a concept written by, you know, it's a Japanese word. It's basically the intersection between what you love, what you do best, but also what the market needs and what they're willing to pay for. This is a transition from mastering yourself, self-awareness to business, right? I love this service, but nobody wants to pay for it. Mm. No gap in the market. You're not going to make money that way. It's just let it be a hobby, okay? Or I love doing this, but I'm no good at it. Again, oops, either you get good at it or find something else that you're good at. Stop wishing that you were someone else, like that business coach I was speaking about, you know? Or uh, sometimes they match, but it's a sharpening tool. For instance, um, I love, you know, coaching people through their eating disorders, okay? Um, there's a gap in the market. People have eating disorders and they're looking for a coach. And this person is also good at it. But what are they willing to pay for? These days, maybe some people will never want to pay for a video because there's YouTube and everything's free. But maybe they'll pay for a workshop. Or maybe these days workshops are, you know, from the days that I started in 2008 until now, workshops has gone down in ticket value until you maybe make it like a lifestyle workshop where you have to be in, a, in you know, an event, um, um, you know, have a couple of days or blah, blah, blah. So what are they willing to work? Uh, what are they willing to pay? It's, it's like a mental exercise to understand your market. What are people willing to pay now? Because many things may have been given for free. Okay. Uh, not to say that just because it's been given for free by other people, you can't charge for it. There's, there are ways, but it's an, it's helping you understand as well. Okay. That all makes sense. Very much so, so any other questions before we go to the next step? Nope. Not that I saw. No. Okay. Good. So we talked about mastering yourself. The second step is mastering your clients or understanding your clients. And it's all about understanding who they are first, who, not how, okay, who is your clients? So if this is me, who do I want to work with is a question, okay? If, if I am a business coach, I love coaching people and growing their business, but my skills and my ikigai points me to start up businesses, then who is my ideal client? So not multinationals, okay, <laughs> not, not big SMEs right? So if I'm a health coach that is now realized that I'm not a health coach only, but I'm to be more specific, I'm an eating disorder coach, then who are the people? People who have trouble with self-acceptance and they're and expressive in their eating, okay? So that's who. It's very important. And what's their journey? So I just made a little cartoon, which helps me. This is one of my favorite slides when I'm explaining this. Again, this is from a book called The Story Brand by Donald Miller really good book. Again, you can do it yourself. They provide a, uh, a website where you can say, do your story brand. Um, a funny thing was I read the book, right? And then I said, oh, I'm going to do it myself. So I logged onto that free browser, which is very generous. And by the way, it is a very good um, online tool. And then you make a profile, make your first story brand. And then they ask you all these questions and you answer them. And then you're like, oh, no, maybe not. Da, 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 da. I made seven versions of my story brand until I realized, right, I knew a girl who is a brand um, um, coach and I contacted her. Um, I said, right, I need your help. I've made seven versions of this. This is not good. <laughs> so I paid her some money and she helped me. <laughs> it's just so frustrating, right? Um, but anyway, so back to the brand story. This is your brand story. So you know who you are, right? You're 
Um, you're not the hero, by the way, you'll come later. So I'm going to talk about the hero. The hero is your clients. So if I know I'm an eating disorder coach, my, my hero, the hero of this brand story is the person who has an eating disorder. Once upon a time, there's this person um, wants to, they, they have dreams, they have desires, but they face a villain. They have the big monster that is keeping them from that dream. So in the first step, we empathize with them. Like, you know, how do they feel having this problem? Uh, what do they want? What's keeping them from what they want? How would they feel if they got the solution? Um, what would their life be like now versus then? You know, all these empathy questions going around for the hero. Then we talk about the villain. Tell us more about the villain. You know, what they can they stand to lose if they if the villain just stays and confronts them all the time? What can they stand to gain if the villain disappears? So all these questions are all included there. So who are you really? You're just a guide. You're not the hero. You're just the guide that get, helps them with a map in a plan or a solution or a promise, this four-step map that he's holding or she's holding. And if you follow this, you can reach success and transform from being depressed to being happy. And, but if you don't follow that, you have failure. Okay, so this is the brand story. Now, when I read that book and I started implementing it for my business and also for the businesses of my clients, I realized that every time I go to many websites for self-employed professionals is positioning the coach as the hero. And this is why you're no different than anybody else. I am this, I am amazing. I've got all this award. I have CV, first page. And then there's an about tab as well, where we can read more, which is not what we want, right? That's why your websites, if this is your, how your website works, your website is not about you. Your website is about, here's this person who's having this problem. You know, you want this, you are having this problem. You feel this, you feel that you've been looking and it's been hard. And these are the challenges you face. The only little bit about you is I have a four-step plan, <laughs> okay? And then there's the about tab that you can fill with all your CV. But even then, after I understand about brand story, my bio, right, is changed. I still look at, uh, I when I passed around, uh, when I printed a brochure, I, I sent it to all my clients, not because I wanted them to promote and everything, but I just said, this is how I make brochures. Maybe it will help you make yours. Even my about was using a lot of you, not I words. We're still using you, you. So I started getting really comfortable with the language of you because ultimately what does what engages people to read on when they hear you, 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 and they're like, oh yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. It's not saying Cynthia, Cynthia, Cynthia. You know, have a couple of paragraphs about yourself. That's fine. But write about something they care to read, which is, wow, this person really understands that I have this problem. Wow, they really understand that I have these fears and challenges and they've got a four-step plan <laughs> or three steps or nine steps or 17 steps, okay? Um, and then give them that reward. If you follow this, you can expect to reach some kind of success and that's where your testimonials and everything come on board as well and to avoid failure, right? So this is the brand story. This is the, 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 the second line, you know, mastering your clients, really putting them as the hero of your story. Now, in this section, we also help you think about, well, if, you know, when a client wants to buy from you, there's usually a, a couple of steps to get through. They need to know you then they need to like you, then they need to trust you, and then they need, and then they will buy. There's a process, no like, trust, buy. So your product range, the other problem that if your business isn't growing, sometimes you have a product range that people hesitate to buy because they don't trust you yet. 
And if that's the only thing you're selling, it's kind of like going to the bar and asking the first person you meet to get married. You know, <laughs> scary. And that's the first thing. You know, there's no chit chat, buy you a drink. There's no, you want to go dancing. You want to have coffee. Even now, you know, with all the Tinder swipe, left swipe, right thing, people always suggest um, that if you're going to date someone, um, do a phone call first and then do a coffee. Don't do a full meal. Just in case you need to escape after 20 minutes, you can, right? But it's the same thing with people buying a service, you know? Um, this is what we call the product ladder. And one of the steps in the Brave Marketing Workbook is to create your low commitment, medium and high commitment product range. And when I say product range, it don't need to be chargeable. So maybe a low commitment one is getting you guys to attend a masterclass by an organization you've already know and you're members of, um, not hosted by Cynthia, but hosted by Julie and the Professional Coaching Association, free, right? And it's included, it's only an hour. So um, low commitment also, not in terms of money, but also in terms of time, okay? So low commitment is not always money, it's also time. So, you know, my first step is to get you into a one day seminar. Oh my God, I'm gonna spend one day with this. One. Even if it's free, lots of people won't say yes, right? But my first step is just an hour. It's just a 15 minute chat, whatever it is, right? Um, it could be a download, okay? And then the second one could be a cheap and good one. A cheap and good solution could be an ebook, could be a little mini workshop, could be whatever. Um, leveraged solutions are more like group things, workshop or group coaching, where this person isn't alone with you. They have other peers, Sometimes some people want that. And then also, you, of course, I like everybody probably has a bespoke solution where it's just one-to-one -one with you forever, you know, that kind of thing. But if that's your only product and that's your first product, it's like, hi, I'm Cynthia. You want to get married? <laughs> you know, it's really scary, right? So um, now, as from a business perspective, it is really difficult to have all that. So I think out of the three, pick at least two, uh, out of the four levels, pick at least two to start with, if not three, if you can manage. Sometimes marketing a group coaching program and a bespoke coaching program can be a little bit um, difficult, especially if you're working by yourself. So some of the coaches that I have coached, I just say, you have too many products that you're trying to market and too many too many spaces that you're trying to fulfill. Just, just focus on what you can do, okay? So maybe just a free, uh, a free solution and then a bespoke uh, offering. That's also good. But many people, they don't do the low commitment stuff. They just expect just going to charm people to marry them straight away, okay? So that's also why sometimes if you don't have that, um, you go into networking, you spend all this time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you don't you don't get results. To me, results is not just a client that pays and gives you a check. Okay, uh, business has taught me to be more process thinking. A result for me is having, let's say, I don't know how many people here, 10, 10 participants, you know, including me. So nine of you here. That's a result. Well, the first result was being asked to be here. Okay, the second result is to be here and meet 10 people. And maybe after Facebook and blah, 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 it'll be 20 people. And maybe the second result is for, for some of you to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn and then send me a message that you want to have a call. And then, and then, and then, right? Some of you might be clients. Some of you may not be clients. I might not have any clients, but you know what? Even if I leave this, and this is for newer coaches, I always say, even if you leave this kind of, you you, you market yourself, they, they give you a chance to present and then you get all these connections on LinkedIn. And for some reason, nobody signs up to be your client. Your result is you learned. Next time, you're going to be a better presenter, a better communicator, or whatever, or maybe it's your, it's the way you approach people when they do call you that frightens them, you know, um, so you've learned. And, and sometimes the learning is that this group isn't your target market. Find another group. Okay, so it's always just think process thinking. 
And so I always say that if you are running, um, if you are trying to market yourself and you're squeezed for cash and you're desperate to make money quickly in a short period of time, either your approach is going to look desperate or you're going to have a difficult time. I always, be, I used to recruit franchisees uh, for the action coach business. And I do check how much cash flow do you have? How desperate are you to make money? Do you have a side job that you can count on as well, right? Because when we do this business out of desperation, don't get me wrong, some people thrive with desperation. They just go Psh, and they get there and then they get all these things. But for the most part, a few people can do that. For the most part, this type of marketing takes time. Okay. And if you're doing it because you're you know, squeezed for cash and this is your only, blah, 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 a lot of things may be disappointing. Okay. So you need to be quite financially stable, in my opinion. Okay. Then you approach people in a way that they like to be approached. Okay. But if you're one of those people who thrive on desperation, great. You know, many people do very well when they push themselves like that. The final thing I want to say about this section is that, okay, so you talked about who is your client, uh, the villain, the solution. And remember that uh, figure of the guide with a four-step plan. What is your four-step plan? What is your signature solution? So my first slide, or when I explain my solutions, is this graph on the bottom right, Brave Marketing. Brave Marketing, I've put a name on it. I've put uh, nine steps to it, three parts. It's a signature solution. There is a way to create a signature solution. I guide people to create theirs as well. And we've seen it, right? Seven habits of highly you know, effective people, you know, the identity iceberg, the time quadrant. We've seen this, the grow model in coaching. These are all signature solutions. It helps put your value in a box. Remember, we're all selling intangible stuff. But once you've got a framework, it becomes a little bit more tangible rather than just a CV or fluff, right? Right. So what is, so my, my client who is the eating disorder has got a 15-step plan, 15 weeks, 15 steps. Okay. And that's her. That's fine. And it could be 30, it could be 18, based on how long it takes. But basically, we're going to go through these 15 steps. And that's come down from, you know, what she's learned about how to treat uh, disorders, her own personal experience, things like that. Okay, so this is not a must, but it helps. It increases your conversion rate. Okay, when people, uh, when I was more actively marketing myself uh, in this business, I had the, in my website and everything like that, this, and I explained step one through nine as I'm doing it to you now. And people say, oh, I love how you have a structure. And I would have an 80% conversion rate on sales calls. Okay, so if you don't have a structure, it's like, well, what are we gonna do when I start paying you? You know, well, we're gonna chat, <laughs> we're gonna talk. <laughs> it's like, again, you know, you go into a shop, you give them the credit card, you expect a bundle of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing. So we can do that uh, for you if you need to. Finally, let's talk about the final thing, which is um, marketing. Uh, marketing, very simple, because now you've got your client, uh, your client brand story, your client journey about what their problem is and everything, you can create a one-liner. And a one-liner typically um, is two sentences. It's called a one-liner, but it's actually two sentences. Um, it's usually something like many, many self, this is mine, many self-employed professionals want to attract their ideal clients, but struggle to do so with clarity and confidence. I have a nine-step plan to help them go from confusion to confidence in four months. Okay, so well, the one liner is actually two sentence and it starts with many target market clients have this problem and they want this and they can't have it. And then the second sentence is, I have a solution and that can give them this with this benefit. Again, that's in the Donald Miller book. Feel free to just read it yourself. Okay. 
And I become the sparring partner. It's like, well, what does that sound? And for me, because I have very little patience, which is a blessing sometimes, I write it for you. I was like, right, okay, by this time, we're on whatever session, right? And I was like, okay, can I propose something? And then they say, and then they tweak it. It's a lot better than having you start from scratch. Because remember, I've, I've listened to you. I've listened to your life story. I've seen you from a, a third person's point of view, a, a different perspective. I'm not you. I'm very detached from it. So then you create your one-liner. So again, the one-liner can be used where? Websites. Um, your business card, your brochure. And it's, it stops you from just saying, I, 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 to now you say you, okay? Now, when we talk about marketing, another interesting uh, part is that understanding the marketing spectrum. The marketing spectrum is um, a, a framework that to help you understand that not every bit of marketing is effective. Some types of marketing is just fluff, waste your time, okay? So this is the marketing spectrum. The quick win versus reputation building strategies. You have loads of marketing strategies. Every time you go to a networking event, every time you have coffee with your friends, what should I do to grow my business? They give you, oh, you know what? You should join Clubhouse. Oh, you know what? I've got this new app that you can do. Oh, you do Instagram and da, da, da. And before you know it, you have 17,000 ideas and you're like, I still have 24 hours a day and I have three kids, you know? So it's, it's, it's not easy. So what I find is you've got to understand that the farther away you are from your client, the lower the conversion rate. If you're behind a laptop, you know, po creating posts, for instance, posting content, you're not even touching your client. You're not even seeing them. You're not talking to them. Okay. And these days we do a lot on Zoom. So what I mean, you are close to your client. It doesn't mean you're physically close side by side, but you're talking to them. You're seeing them on the screen in Zoom and they're attending your seminar. That has higher conversion rate than posting content about brave marketing. You know, this sort of thing, if you can get uh, speaking in these kinds of forums, you can like speaking, that's low, right? Closer to quick win. That's a higher conversion rate than just posting about how great brave marketing is on LinkedIn. You get likes, but who cares, right? And so we're not chasing likes, we're chasing clients or we, we need clients, we don't need likes, okay? So again, so when you say, but I've done everything, okay. How many of those are reputation building strategies with very low conversion rate? If you talk to any digital marketer and you say, well, if I post a digital ad, you get like a million impressions, but how many are converted into paying clients? Well, if you can just get 1%, that's amazing, Right? It's the same thing. Reputation building strategies expect lower conversion rate. And if you have time for that and you have money for that, go for it, right? But if you are strapped for cash, focus on quick win strategies, which is typically 50 to 70%. And this is by doing things like networking, speaking in you know, forums like this, um, holding your own workshops or have, holding workshops with a strategic alliance that has the same target market that you want or just getting referrals. Many of us have lots of very satisfied clients, but we're too shy to get referrals. Okay, so we always have to start from scratch all the time. Lots of coaches, if, they, if you've been doing this for a while, lots of coaches just focus on referral business. One of the coaches that work in our firm, well, no, two now, um, they just, they fill, they fill their week just with referrals, okay? They don't even have to do anything else. Their social media is so disappointing because they don't need to, <laughs> okay? They, they've got their, their real social life, okay? Um, and finally, it's about um, marketing strategy, being really honest with yourself about what marketing strategy works for you and features you at your best. So... Uh, I had this business coach. Um, she is very shy on camera. She cannot imagine herself doing, hi, I'm uh, YouTube videos. Couldn't do it. Uh, she couldn't even take pictures of herself. Okay. Um, but she's very good at guiding business people about cash flow and all these kinds of things. So she, she says, all right, I'm just take one picture of myself. And so she has one picture. This is how she, and she realizes LinkedIn posts and articles. This is what features. I, she's a good writer. And so she takes one picture of herself and then she posts 
that picture with different tips every week. And she has a regular, consistent schedule. And it always starts with, let's talk about dot, 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 let's say customer service. And then she does two paragraphs of customer service tips. And it has that one boring picture of herself, which is the only one she can stand to look at. <laughs> but that's her, you know? And that's, and she's getting engagement. She's getting clients. She's getting known because of her amazing consistency. And yeah, that you, you get, LinkedIn does like it when you put a bit of picture, but you know, articles was the way she features herself best. Some people love Instagram. She would die if she had Instagram. Okay. <laughs> and that's not her thing. It works for everybody else, but it's not your thing. It won't work for you. Remember, the reason why it's so important to have marketing strategies that you like is because no marketing would work the first time around. You've got to be consistent and you've got to enjoy doing it. If you Saying, okay, fine, I really hate Instagram, but I have to do it every week. I bet you, you're going to find a new hobby or a stupid excuse. Like you're going to walk your dog five times a day just not to do Instagram. <laughs> because that's a great excuse not to do it because you hate it. So do something you like. Because marketing, especially in this business, takes consistency. And, it, and it, it, you need to exude passion and happiness when you're doing it. Okay. So to me, what's the best marketing strategy? I'm sure there's algorithms that tell you one or the other, but for me, in my experience, you've got, unless you're outsourcing this, right? And you've got enough money to follow the latest trend. If you're doing it all yourself, focus on the one or two marketing strategies that you do best and just be consistent. That's how you're going to save money because it's actually going to work. Okay. And the final thing about marketing is really creating a commitment, an action plan about um, what you're going to do next. A business improvement plan is the final part of this uh, Brave Marketing Program. It's, um, what we do is, is like this. When you want to improve a business, there's two types of activities you need to focus on. The first is routine activities, okay? The consistent everything. Um, so let's say your routine activities is to commit to uh, a certain number of networking events a month, a uh, month. Uh, You've got to commit to getting yourself in a speaking platform once a quarter or whatever it is. It's a routine thing, right? Getting yourself uh, five uh, diagnostic calls or discovery calls a month, for instance, right? That's routine. So that's the first type of activity that you need to focus on. The second type is a one-time improvement. For instance, you are fulfilling your numbers. You have one seminar quarter, you have five discovery calls a month, and you're still not getting clients. Why? Because you're being very consistent. Fine. The problem is your sales script sucks. Or your, your, the way you speak in a seminar, maybe you're very nervous and you, don't, you haven't learned public speaking and you, you, you don't do very well. So the one-time system improvement type of activity is determining things that don't work and improving them. So if you need to take a public speaking course, if you need to rethink with someone, what's the best way to talk to people when they have booked a discovery call so that they can, they can decide to sign the contract, for instance. You know, maybe you don't come from a sales background, which is pretty normal uh, with people who, who go into their own business. I'm quite fortunate because I came from sales, but not everybody has that, okay? So maybe it's rewriting that script, okay? Uh, or maybe it's as simple as like a financial planner client of mine setting a room where you can work because she has four kids where people are not disturbing you all the time. Okay. Setting boundaries with your family. If you're working from home, that could help, you know? So the if you're not, if you're not achieving your goals, let's look at your, what you're doing. And is there anything that you need to improve? Is there something that's not routine enough? Like, I, I love this, you know, people, they don't come from a sales degree uh, or an experience. They don't know how to sell. They're shy. And they think just having two sales meetings a month will get them one client. I said, you got to be a pretty good salesperson to close 50%. <laughs> I don't even accept that, except, uh, expect that out of my staff when I was leading sales teams. So be good to yourself, you know, just practice, practice, practice. 
So uh, basically that's it. If you want to know more about how it can work for you, email me. I don't have a, a website anymore because I decided, you know, I don't want to spend money on, on a business. I'm not uh, marketing anymore. So I stopped my GoDaddy subscription. I just go by LinkedIn now. So if you want to know the full testimonials, I've got like 98 testimonials. I've got my whole life stories in LinkedIn. Uh, but I decided not to overcomplicate my life. I stopped my Brave Zone. Cynthia at the Brave Zone is no longer active. So just CynthiaWeharjet at gmail.com. I get that. Uh, I have a shop email. So I just keep things simple. I'm a pretty uh, Marie Kondo type of person. I don't have too many things in my life uh, and it just keeps things simple. So as soon as I... If I, if I ever get back into it again, but LinkedIn has been something I've had for two decades and it's, it's, I've been on LinkedIn since forever. So I love LinkedIn. So I feel, yeah, I don't need a website. Many people don't have websites anymore. They just have LinkedIn. So um, yeah. Any questions? Well, first of all, comments? thank you. I mean, wow. I mean, I must say it certainly resonated with me an awful lot, what you were saying. And judging by all the nods that I was seeing uh, amongst the participants, I'm not the only one. There were a lot of uh, points which were actually too close for comfort because I'm, I've am i been coaching since 2009 as well. Um, and I thought you brought it across in a very structured and professional but very human um, and funny often way which uh, your examples were fantastic so I mean we do have uh, five minutes does anybody have a, a burning question I mean feel free to just unmute yourself we're not such a huge group that we can't do that but feel free to do it let's make use of having such a wonderful expert with us here you've obviously got a lot of experience and expertise does anyone have a question I'm trying to look everywhere at the same time. Clara. Uh, yeah, yes. Clara. Um, hi, thank you so much. That was really interesting. I um, yeah, I took a lot away from that. Thank you. Um, I've just finished working with a client for about three months. So um, I do executive coaching, but I still haven't nailed my two sentences. So you've definitely given me something to think about. Um, and I've got a couple of testimonials under my belt now. I'm still quite junior when it comes to coaching I'm about a year in 100 hours um how do I use the great testimonials I've had to get new clients like them so these are like executives who are either promoted that have like imposter syndrome or um are ready to take the next step in their career are you using LinkedIn like would you advise using LinkedIn to target similar people with those testimonials for example um because I'm ready to take on your clients do you have do you have a website not yet I actually got my first client without a website which is crazy and I kind of thought no, well, I, yeah I'm, I'm just trying to to think your LinkedIn profile your your uh intro and in LinkedIn should should have your wine liner I would say now that you've got a couple of clients in and yeah. you know you you're starting to know what value you give work yeah. on your sentences that's uh yeah. work on your client story understand their their journey and how you become a guide to them and if there is a way for you to clarify your you know three-step plan or whatever it is or how you do it great okay um but uh that will give you a lot of clarity you know, how you use the testimonials is really first to help you understand what value you give. So I like rereading my testimonials to say, oh, wow, I thought I was just a technical business coach with marketing and sales experience and profit increase, blah, blah, blah. Actually, a lot of testimonials have nothing to do with that. It was clarity, confidence, um, all that you know, helping them be courageous and doing things. And, and, and I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'm not that kind of coach. You know, um, and and so the testimonies give you clarity about yourself, but even better if you can do your why and your brand story, it'll be really good. And then when you're clear, all the stuff, where do you put it in which profile, which business card, which, you know, uh, proposal, that'll, that's just standard sales, right? But I think sometimes you, you're, it's good that you've got a few under your belt. So now they're telling you what kind of coach you are. Yeah. yeah. No, I've learned so much from my clients as well, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Good. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I've got another Cynthia there. <laughs> yes. 
very rare to find Cynthia's, I tell you. Aha, uh-huh. lucky us. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, then I would say, you know, again, uh, on behalf of the IAPCNM and the CPD Business Building Masterclasses, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. And thank you to all of you for having been here, for having participated in wanting to also become better coaches and, and get more clients so we can help those around us. Um, As I always say, do make time and add your notes to your CPD log before you forget them. Just now, while it's fresh, you know, write them all down, log it in your book. And it's now now it's up to us. You know, we've just heard an awful lot of incredible advice. So let's make it better than just taking notes and shutting the book and putting it away, but actually take action on what Cynthia has suggested here. And, you know, maybe contacting Cynthia for for direct help if, uh, if we feel we can't do it alone. And that was a very good point I thought you made on two occasions, at least, Cynthia, the fact that sometimes we really do need somebody else to ask the question, which is probably the reason why we became coaches in the first place, because we know the power of the third person asking those questions so thank you very much to all of you good luck with everything on your various missions and uh Cynthia, maybe you come back with more expertise another time <laughs> all the best to all of you bye bye then bye thank you very much julie thanks everyone bye bye